Okay, so I said something in a recent video that annoyed some of you. Now, my offense was spoiling a sitcom that ended over three years ago, and then snarkily implying that spoilers aren't that big of a deal. And if that little spoiler ruins your enjoyment of it, I think that's more of a you problem than a me problem. Now, we've talked before about why spoilers might not be that bad, specifically in the context of a video on the Clone Wars. It's also our only video that includes two hosts on screen, and our only video where one of those hosts just slaps the absolute sh out of the other one. Oh, God, you, you really hit me! And because you asked, uh, here's that clip again in slow motion. So, did hearing that someone was getting slapped before you saw the clip make it any less satisfying to watch Helen absolutely wreck my face? Probably not. But maybe for some of you, knowing that the slap was gonna happen took all the surprise out of it. In other words, I spoiled it. And today, as spoilers are more of a cultural crime than ever before, we wanted to take a step back and ask, are spoilers actually a thing? Is the term a complete misnomer? What does the concept of a spoiler mean on a philosophical level? And do they really ruin the viewer experience or is good art unspoilable? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition, are we wrong about spoilers? And spoilers ahead for our most passionate argument about why your biggest fear is a cultural boogeyman. Now, let's start by defining spoiler. According to one definition, a spoiler is an element of a disseminated summary or description, any narrative that reveals plot elements with the implication that the experience of discovering the plot naturally as the creator intended it has been spoiled. Typically, the details of the conclusion of the plot, including the climax and ending, are especially regarded as spoiler material. In practice, most spoilers look like accidentally telling someone that uh, made a surprise appearance in the movie or that was actually all along or that the main character uh, played by and has the things the internet seems to get the most upset about are surprises reveals and twists more so than specific plot mechanics character motivations or creative filmmaking choices because who cares about that stuff anyways while spoilers have become a ubiquitous part of modern discourse it's actually a recent concept. According to Vox writer Emily St. James, for most of human history, the idea of a spoiler would have felt rather curious. Many of the great Greek tragedies announce in their opening dialogue exactly what's going to happen, and Shakespeare's plays were largely built atop historical tales and famous stories many in his audience would have been familiar with. The great novels of the 18th and 19th centuries often simply stated outright in chapter names what happened in those chapters. Also in the Bible, like when Jesus dies, we know he's coming back. You, you know it, you know, we wouldn't, if he didn't come back, why would we be at mass right now? Why would we be doing all this if he didn't come back? But hey, it's still a compelling narrative at times, I guess. And in 1976, George Lucas straight up explained the plot of Star Wars to the New York Times a full year before the film came out. And lest you think I'm exaggerating, here's what he said. Inevitably, the adventurers fall foul of Governor Tarkin and his Death Star, a huge space station the size of a small moon on which the princess is imprisoned. And just as inevitably, it all comes right in the last reel. The Emperor's secret weapon is destroyed, the princess is rescued, and the forces of evil routed in a final spaceship dogfight conducted along World War II lines. The sinister Black Knight is allowed to slink away, however, to scheme again another day thereby keeping the door open for a possible sequel. Um, spoiler alert, Star Wars still became one of the most successful and influential films of all time. And this is all to say nothing of trailers for older films, which would often reveal basically the entire plot. Arguably modern spoiler alerts began with a 2005 review of Million Dollar Baby in which Roger Ebert wrote that reviewers had a responsibility to not spoil films. And with all respect due to Uncle Roger, the big twist of that movie is, is so dumb that knowing it in advance could save you from spending the previous two hours thinking that this film might do something interesting. I just hope you found some place where you could find a little peace. Now, soon after this, in 2007, searches for spoiler alerts started trending on Google and they've gone up ever since, surely having nothing to do with the dawn of the MCU in 2008. Indeed, whether it's been about Harry Potter movies or Game of Thrones or superhero movies produced by the Walt Disney Corporation that, that serve as advertisements for toys, video games, and theme parks, we've been worried about spoilers ever since. And as St. James notes, 
Most of the spoiler anxiety is centered around media made by Disney and other mega corporations, in particular the MCU. She writes, most of the time, the biggest conversations around spoilers center on enormous franchises where the range of possible outcomes is incredibly narrow. To preserve an untainted experience is a weird act of faith that the rules of the world you love are still the rules of the world you love. The biggest example of this was the massive no spoilers campaign around the release of Avengers Endgame. Don't spoil the Endgame. In which the filmmakers and cast begged the public to go an entire weekend without spoiling the movie. Which is honestly kind of funny because we all knew more or less what was gonna happen and we all knew that all the folks who disappeared in Infinity War were coming back because they were all the most famous ones. Um, and you especially knew this if you'd read any of the comics. But at the same time, Marvel Studios was taping Tom Holland's mouth shut, actual scientific geniuses were doing research that showed our worries about spoilers were maybe just kinda made up. Also, shout it out in the comments if one of your kinks would involve duct taping Tom Holland's mouth shut. One of these folks, UC San Diego psychology professor, Nicholas Christenfeld, found that spoiling stories actually helps people enjoy them. In his study, participants were read stories from three genres, literary stories, mystery stories, and ironic twist stories, with half of them hearing the stories with no prior context, and half having them accidentally spoiled by the researcher. According to Christenfeld, what we found remarkably was if you spoil stories, they actually enjoy them more. He went on to say that across all three genres, spoilers actually were enhancers. The term is wrong. When reflecting on these results, he points out that, of course, many of us watch romantic comedies, knowing damn well that the unlikely couple is going to end up together. Shall we? Or detective movies, knowing that the protagonist is definitely going to solve the case. Fran's alive? Oh, yes. Fran, who will confirm this very story? or some are close to it, and send you, Hugh, to jail. This led Christenfeld to say that really we're not watching these things for the ending. People watch these movies more than once happily and often with increasing pleasure. Now, personally, I experienced a spoiler recently when I was traveling during a very pivotal episode of Succession and had a paradigm shifting event spoiled for me on Twitter. But then I watched it, and by the end, I was pretty sure it was one of the best episodes of TV I had seen in years. If anything, knowing about The Thing helped me not worry about mysterious twists, and instead just focus on the actors' performances and their emotional stakes. But there might be one way that spoilers are making things objectively worse, and that's how they're affecting the very production of film and television. Our obsession with not being spoiled and consuming content as fast as possible has led studios to try and avoid spoilers at all costs, even if this means modifying scripts or not letting cast and crew know what's going on while they're on set. This is Brie Larson describing what it's like as an actor in the spoiler-adverse MCU ecosystem. I flew to Atlanta for my first day on Endgame. I had no idea what I was shooting, what the movie was. I didn't know if anybody else was in a scene with me. I didn't know anything. And it's not until you show up that you get your pages for the day, but you only get your part. So it was like a scene that was completely black redacted and then just my one line. And hearing this quote, I can't help but think about this book I read recently called The Method on History of Method Acting, where we learn about actors like Dustin Hoffman and Robert De Niro spending months learning about their character in that world to train just to get ready. And now we have an actor that gets flown across the country with a piece of paper and no idea what they're doing and they're expected to give a good performance. This is crazy, guys. This is crazy. It just is. Now, one of the most famous definitions of acting is that it is reacting. But in this case, the actor is left reacting to a green screen and a page full of blacked out dialogue. It'd almost be like having to give a good performance when you're just in a little room by yourself reading words off a digital screen with no one around to really affirm or deny what you're doing, wondering if you're really just in a solipsistic, solipsistic hole. I don't even know words anymore. What is this sh It's hard to imagine even the best actor giving a truly emotionally committed and affecting performance in these conditions. And boom! But on the bright side, at least we never have to worry about Jeremy Strong selling out 
and joining a superhero franchise. More subtly, it's easy to imagine that the sensationalism surrounding spoiler culture puts pressure on studios to ensure their films have jaw-dropping twists and turns for the sake of box office success. This prioritization of spectacle over creative and compelling storytelling leads to ham-fisted third-act twists that can undermine all that we'd enjoyed up until that point. And while I am still refusing to watch it, it sure sounds like this is what happened in Don't Worry Darling. You know, my favorite thing about the movie is like, it feels like a, like a movie. The larger point here is that when studios construct films and series like this, it prioritizes plot mechanics over meaning. And to be clear, unless any of you feel judged by me, all of this is being said by someone who already has tickets for a 3 p.m. showing of Guardians Volume 3 on the Thursday it opens. Honestly, I've, I've missed the first screening of like two MCU movies in the past decade, okay? So the finger's being pointed at myself too, you know? We're all in this together. Okay, so if you've stuck around until now, first of all, thank you. And second of all, I'll assume that you're okay with a little philosophical tangent. Because I couldn't help but think about the experience I've had when reading difficult works of philosophy, in which I'm hoping to sort of discover what's happening during my first read. But more often than not, I'm barely hanging on, and if I'm lucky, by the end of the text, I kinda get what Hegel is saying. But at a certain point, I realized that if I read introductory text or summaries and first got my head around the big ideas, it made reading these books much more enjoyable. Since I already knew where it was headed, I could start to see how the pieces were adding up and where it was all going. In this way, you often need to get to the end to then actually understand what was happening at the beginning. Kind of like when um, I broke up with an ex after she cheated on me and it, it made no sense, but then I realized the day that I met her, she told me about her friend, Jamie, who was her life coach and they were really close and they hung out all the time and he was telling her how to live her life. And it's like, oh yeah, of course she had sex with that guy on Christmas while I was alone. Um, and then told me about it later when we were watching an episode of Mad Men together. And in the episode of Mad Men, Don was cheating. I looked at her and I said, I want you to know I would never cheat on you. And then she started crying. She told me she cheated. And then I threw up a little bit. Real thing that happened. And I've started to see how the same thing can often affect the way I consume media. And especially films. Oddly enough, sometimes the more interesting the film, the more helpful knowing the overall plot can be. Rather than trying to figure out, wait, what's going on here? I can focus on the individual scenes and character actions. And in this way, rather than focusing on the destination of some final reveal or resolution, it's about the journey of experiencing the thing itself. And this doesn't necessarily cancel out thrill and intrigue. Like, even though some people kind of spoiled the movie Barbarian for me last year, I was still on the edge of my seat just wondering how it was all going to play out. And I still had a very good time. And I still never want to stay in an Airbnb in a deserted in a deserted neighborhood in Detroit. No offense, Detroit, but not doing it. Now, to quote Kierkegaard, who I'm confident would have just hated spoiler culture, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Meaning that we can't really understand what's happening while it's happening, but only after the fact. And in this way, meaning often ends up being retroactive. So maybe you're a college student who hates being a pre-med major. But then you start writing poems in between your pig heart dissections. And eventually you switch majors to English and you realize you've been miserable because you've actually had no passion or interest in medicine. Now it's only later that you'll realize there are more jobs for doctors than there are for poets, but we're not gonna spoil the devastating plot twist of your 30s for you just yet. And there is something similar happening with our experience of narrative media. We only really understand the best stories retroactively. The movie Reservoir Dogs is a great example here, as it's only at the very end of the film that we fully understand what's been happening all along. And while it's a fun, oh sh moment to discover organically, they don't know. They don't know sh I'm very confident that if you read the plot summary first, you would still absolutely love the movie. Now, movies like this, or The Usual Suspects, thus invite multiple rewatches as we further understand and appreciate what was going on the whole time, and how everyone from the actor to the screenwriter to the director to the sound editor helped contribute to the film's grand illusion. Now, the master of the modern twist, M. Night Shyamalan, is instructive here. As in his best films, the twist and reveals don't render rewatches useless. I see people. 
If anything, they invite frequent rewatches so that you can see how the real story was there all along. It provides a whole other perspective on the story such that you retroactively can make sense of it. I'm gonna be honest, I really wanna spoil the sixth sense here just as a, as a performative exercise to see if someone in the comments gets mad at me for spoiling a movie that's been out for over 20 years. I'm not going to do it, but I want to, but note that I'm capable of restraint. Now, in this way, knowing spoilers about the sixth sense or the village don't ruin them. If anything, they can help you get a better sense of what's really going on. And Shyamalan himself, intentionally or not, puts this whole thing on its head in his most recent film, where, spoiler alert, there wasn't really a big twist. Everything just sort of was what it was. And in doing this, the movie, maybe inadvertently, points out how silly it can be to consume art while just constantly looking for the big twist. Maybe this is the way it's always been. Maybe families have been deciding this all through time. On the other hand, if knowing about a plot element or twist makes it such that you have no interest in rewatching something, well guys, it just probably wasn't that good in the first place. And to put even more of my cards on this table, I've watched movies like Infinity War and Endgame a lot. I mean like, like double digits lots of times, precisely because the performances and action sequences are so enjoyable. And knowing all of the big twists doesn't take away from that because, uh. For the most part, they don't, they don't really matter that much. So, are we trying to say that we should all have free reign to spoil things whenever we want? No, absolutely not. It upsets a lot of people and we should not be dicks. Just don't be a dick. But what we are saying is that the idea that having something spoiled might ruin the experience of the work itself doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Because at best, knowing where a story is going can help us make deeper sense of it. And at worst, it can help us realize that the story in question is more spectacle than actual plot-driven narrative. And in the meantime, I did want to let you guys know that uh, in the forthcoming Guardians of the Galaxy 3 film, we learn that the entire movie has been one <laughs> rebranding as a <laughs> NFT company, <laughs> and that <laughs> in the Guardians represents a different <laughs> on the McDonald's menu. It's <laughs> and they're rebooting the series using as heroes, it's and it sounds weird, but hey, who am I to say that a based on Helen Keller can't of the MCU? But what do you guys think? Can knowing how a story ends help our experience of the story itself? Can being spoiled actually make things better? Or is this just an elaborate way to alleviate my guilt for ruining a couple episodes of The Good Place? A show in which they let you know in the first episode that they're all dead. Okay, but let us know in the comments. Um, thank you so much to all of our patrons. Um, spoiler, if you sign up for our Patreon, you get videos early with no ads. You get extra audio and video content. You get to hear me talk a lot more about big ideas in detail. And you get to jump on our Discord server and chat with people. It's pretty fun. It's also the best way that you can directly support us. So there's a link in the description. Consider checking it out. But know that no matter what, you are supporting us by being here, by watching our videos, by subscribing, ringing the bell, clicking the thumbs up, all of those things. They all mean a lot, and we really, really, really appreciate it. In the meantime, bug your pastor about spoiling the end of the Bible next time you're at church, and we'll see you later.